Hey, gentlemen, and maybe one or two ladies, probably more. I don't know if you, I don't know how many ladies are actually listening to this, but hey, welcome to the world's second greatest podcast, No Tux Allowed. Uh, we are not the greatest because if we were the greatest, we would have nobody to base our further improvements from. But uh, to hear to tell us that we are, in fact, the greatest podcast in, in the world, I have my best friend here who's probably going to know a lot more about this first subject than me, Big Pod. And of Hello. course, uh, you can see that he's just as energetic as ever. But anyways, uh, Big Pod, I have a question for you. Pirates or Ask. ninjas? Ninjas? Ninjas. You know, when I used yeah. to ask people, they used to say pirates. Because Pirates of the Caribbean was a fresh and hot new movie. <laughs> For me, it will always be ninjas. Well, of course, because ninjas are always better. Okay, yes. another question. Did you know that wine is uh, taking over mono? No. Oh, well, uh, you can see that Microsoft uh, has decided that uh, they're not really using mono that much anymore. And rather than doing like the thing where it's just like, yeah, this is abandonware, they just kind of just handed it over to uh, Wine. That's nice to hear. So, for those who do not know what Mona is, do you, should we should talk Probably about it? Probably should, right? because I'll be honest with you, I don't. <laughs> okay, so Mona is essentially an open source re-implementation of what is called .NET Framework. For those who don't know what .NET Framework is, it's the runtime behind the old versions of C-sharp that you find on Windows. It's the old one that is that nobody uses anymore except legacy applications. The one that it doesn't work on, on Linux, which is why a Linux rewrite, an open source rewrite was needed. And it was made by a company called Zimian. Zimian was started by two actually quite influential people in open source and, uh, well, C-sharp world and GNOME, funny enough. First off was Nat Friedman. He was one of the founders. Nat Friedman is now mostly known for him being CEO, CEO of GitHub after Microsoft uh, bought GitHub, but... Before that, he was also a ch chairman of GNOME Foundation, and as I mentioned, founder of Zimian, and also a founder of Xamarin. The other, other person who founded Zimian, and was also the main person behind Mono, was Michael de Casa. Michael, Mi Miguel de Casa, let me correct myself. Miguel de Casa who, among other things, created this little desktop environment called GNOME. Also created things like Mid Midnight Commander and was one of the earliest contributors to Vine. So, yeah, like, important people. And the reason they created Mono is because c -sharp didn't work on Linux. And, well, here we are. Fun fact, uh, one of the versions of GNOME, Miguel de Icaza actually wanted uh, the extensions and all that to be primarily written in C-sharp. Instead, JavaScript. Great. I feel like that probably would have been a, Nobody bit of a smarter move than, you know, sticking with JavaScript because, you know, yes. I'm, a, I'm of the firm belief but... that JavaScript does not belong on the server. And as and because I hold that opinion, it also probably shouldn't belong in my desktop environment. Yes, the only place JavaScript belongs is inside the browser and nowhere else. 
it was made for that. We should for, we shouldn't forget that. And so, how Microsoft got to Mono? That's another part of the story we need to tackle. So, as I said, Zimian created Mono, so it wasn't Microsoft. Zimian was bought by Novell, but at one point, uh, Mono was, I believe, abandoned by Novell or sold by Novell. Not sure. Well, if, I believe uh, Novell was at the time also bought by, I believe, Attachmate. Yeah, uh, Novell acquired Zimian in 2003, at which point, uh, after a while, in 2011, Attachmate acquired Novell. And... And in May of 2011, Miguel de Icaza announced on his blog that Mono would continue to be supported by Xamarin after Attachmate started to flounder on it. What was Xamarin? Xamarin was essentially the new company by Miguel de Icaza and Ned Friedman, and it was primarily applications for native Android, iOS, and Windows in C-sharp using Mono. So you could write your uh, iOS application and your Android application using same, mostly same code and in a, a, in a different language than what they primarily support which at the time for iOS was, I believe, Objective-C, and for Android was Java. So, Xamarin being another option. And in... I don't want to lie, so I'm going to be very specific. In 2016, Microsoft acquired Xamarin. That's how Mono and Ned Friedman and Miguel de Icaza came to Microsoft, at which point uh, Ned Friedman at the, what, uh, 2019, became CEO of GitHub after Microsoft acquired it. Would 2019 be right here? Mm, I believe so. Let's see. Oh, 2018. 2018, yeah. So, that's the short history of it. Now, for those of you who are now, who may not be in the world of .NET and, and .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Mono, and all of those runtimes, you may, maybe, what's the point, and why Microsoft stopped using Mono, because, well, it's C Sharp on Linux. In some year, which I forget which, it's a good thing I have this thing called uh, Internet, so I can look up. So that would be 2016. Microsoft released the first version of .NET Core, which was from ground up built .NET runtime separate from the framework, .NET framework, which was at the time normally called .NET, which is incorrect, especially now, we're gonna get to that. But .NET Core was new reimagining, it was open source, and it was to be working on all platforms. And yet it is open source. I think, at that point, I believe at that point it was already open source, it started as open source. And that's when I first started thinking about moving to Linux because of that. I was C sharp writer, so, programmer of C sharp a lot. So, but that, that that's besides the point. And as I said it it ran, ran ran on Linux. With, but at that time, sooner or later, Xamarin joined uh, Microsoft, so they still needed Mono. But with the release of 
.NET MAUI, which is uh, basically next version of Xamarin, which runs using now the fourth .NET framework we're going to talk about called .NET, which is essentially evolution of .NET Core from when it was version 3.1, it jumped to .NET 5. And that's what we're using now in that C Sharp world. .NET 5, .NET 6, 7, and we're currently on version 8. We believe version 7 of .NET, it came, came with .NET MAUI, uh, a multi-platform app UI which started using .NET, primary .NET, the, the main .NET that Microsoft develops. So they don't need Mono anymore. There is, I believe there is no actual projects or products that um, relies on Mono, but I could be wrong. So at that point, why would Microsoft be maintaining it? So they did a good thing and gave it to Wine. Well, glad to see that the mono is not going anywhere. Yeah. And you know the Wine project, those guys have some freaking talent because uh, you got to remember, like the kind of work, yeah. the efforts that they have to go through to make sure that <coughs> Windows binaries actually execute properly. Yeah. So uh, if if you're interested in working with uh, .NET, uh, it. Ha it has been uh, moved towards the WineHQ GitLab instance, which I think that is basically just WineHQ.org. It might be like git.winehq.org. I haven't actually checked myself. But uh, it's it's going to be an existing mono mono, so mono project, uh, project name with repo. And uh, other repositories are going to be available as well. Uh, binaries will still be available from previous sources for the next four years because that's when Microsoft is going to stop deploying it themselves and at that point hopefully the wine team can figure out how they're how they're wanting to distribute the binaries probably through like a git release page or something like that similar to how most other GitLab instances handle it yeah and uh they recommend that uh, you switch over to .NET sooner than later yeah, you should switch to .NET, the, the .NET 8, or when in November .NET 9 came, comes out. You should probably use that. It is primarily supported by Microsoft and an open source community. Well, it's an open source thing. I believe it's MIT. It probably is. I it it makes sense for for micro, if Microsoft's yeah. going to open source something, that would be MIT and not the GPL. Yeah. So you can... It's really great to use. In some cases, it's faster than Windows. Which is really funny to me. Yep. And and funny, some features come to Linux first, for some reason. Which is also funny to me. Probably because a lot of developers are using Linux? Not because of that. But because they, they didn't make them for oh, Windows. For that. Uh, there was like a feature some for something, I believe it was extractionless single fire single file uh, runtime application, basically where it zips together into or zips or compresses together into a single file the whole of the application and the runtime. And in Windows, it first had to do an extraction of some sort. So to get that on Linux, it, it was able to do it without extraction part. So that's why extraction less. But I could be remembering incorrectly. So don't don't hold me to that. But I believe that that was the feature that was primarily first available on Linux and then on Windows months later. OK, OK. Well, uh, in other news, Big Pod, how often do you pay attention to the kernel mailing list? Not at all. Okay, so whenever I hear something about kernel mailing list, it's probably from YouTube. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, Linus Torvald, uh, the maintainer of the Linux kernel, has uh, posted a rather interesting email expressing regrets over uh, merging Bcash FS. You ready? You ready for some drama here, uh, Big Pod? Well, it's it's kernel mailing list, and it's on our podcast, so it has to be some tr- drama. Uh, of course, of course, there is. So, uh, a while back, I. Uh, uh, but before we begin, if there are any any things that are not for safe listening, I'm sorry, but we won't be censoring well, them. Well, I'm not going to be like quoting quoting directly here, uh, but uh, there there is going to be a link of to course. the conversation in the show notes, and and I do recommend that you know if you want some like uh, enter entertainment, I'll I'll call it, or like you kind of want to learn like how. Uh, the the kernel release cycle uh emerge window processes work uh give it a read but anyways on august 23rd kent overstreet the developer of bcash fs a newly merged file system in the linux kernel uh submitted a merge request with the first line saying hi linus big one this time dot 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 no more bug reports related to disk accounting rewrite Things are looking good over here as far as regressions go. And he proceeds to list off all the changes, which is a lot of stuff. And uh, because, you know, I imagine that there's a Bcache FS fan out there somewhere. Uh, <coughs> according to th- this merge request, Bcache FS is now four times faster than XFS on Create Trees. And roughly even on what is created that I don't actually know. <laughs> I don't know my file systems that well. But um, uh, the important part is, is that he submitted this on August twenty third. This is actually after the merge request window for the Linux next branch because we're getting ready for the next Linux release. Oh, yeah. And not only did this fix bugs. This this fixed some old regressions, and it also touched non bcache fs code. So seriously, yes. So the very first response to uh, Kent's merge request was from Linus Torvalds himself. Good. The very first line is, "Yeah, no, enough is enough." The last pull was already big. Talking about a previous pull request. But so he says that this one here gonna be, yeah, as someone who who worked in corporate environments, and worked on open source projects and worked on personal projects, pull requests should be only specifically about what that one thing. Touching other things ain't part of the pull request. Five, you're putting five features. No, you're putting one feature into a pull request. Another one, one feature in one pull request. Of course, they have different rules. Of course, but that's normal to put to split features into separate pull requests. That's what Git allows. Yep. After all. Yep. Well, uh, Linus goes on here. Uh, this is simply too big. It touches non bcache FS stuff, and it's not even remotely some kind of regression. At some point, fix something turns into development. And this is at that point. And then he proceeds to say that nobody's saying uses Bcache FS and expects it to be stable. So every single user is technically at an experimental site. Which, uh, I know that there are some uh, p- places out there that deploy Bcache FS file systems in production. Really? Yes. Now, I don't care how stable you say it is. I understand that it is stable and that you quote unquote never lose data. But at the same dang time, I could say the same about, about ButterFS back in the day too. That said, yeah. You're not saying you shouldn't be <laughs> Yes. Because how long has Bcache FS been around compared to its competition? I would rather use ext4 over Bcache FS at this point in time. Simply because Bcache FS has only has only been natively in the kernel for less than a year. The project has been yeah. existed for, I believe it's less than five years total that the project has existed. 
And this is a file system we're talking about. This isn't just yeah. some application. This is the thing that holds and maintains your data. So I don't care if you if you claim that's stable. Linus is right at this point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, back to what Linus says here. Uh, the Bcache FS patches have simply become these kinds of lots of development during release cycles rather than before the re release cycle to the point where I'm starting to regret merging Bcache FS. If Bcache FS can't work sa sanely within the normal upstream kernel release schedule, maybe it shouldn't be in the normal uh, upstream release kernel. This is getting beyond ridiculous. Signed, Linus. Now, <laughs> uh, Linus has said things like this before. I can't reference any directly uh, because I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know he has said stuff like this before. And as somebody that has watched the kernel mailing list forever, uh, th if uh, this talk goes on, we're going to get a Lightus rant out of it. And uh, we, when Lightus starts ranting on the mailing list, that's when it makes it onto Reddit. <laughs> this, is all, <laughs> this is steering towards that point. Uh, this will be interesting for... What else Linus will say? Uh, yeah. So, uh, Kent Overstreet wrote a response. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Universal consensus is that Bcache FS is definitely more trustworthy than ButterFS. It depends. Universal consensus by who? Right. Who? <laughs> the five people running it in production versus the... I honestly, before last year, I haven't heard of Bcache FS. I even if even if I wanted to run it, I'm not going to run it because, first of all, most of the stuff I do are desktops, or I, or if I'm doing server stuff, I'm gonna do an ButterFS or ext4 root disk, and everything else will be on a Ceph yeah. cluster. Because well, I am, I may not be sane, but I, I am a different kind of insane. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, I've personally been deploying ButterFS for the past four four and a half years now, and I have never yeah. lost data that I didn't yeah. directly lose myself. But it was never the file system's fault. <laughs> Thank goodness I discovered yeah. snapshots. Uh, but uh. Uh, people even compare Bcache FS's robust ter robustness in positive terms versus XFS. Again, this is at anecdotal at best. Blighted, he's the he's the lead developer. Of course, he's going to hear this stuff because uh, yeah. there's a lot of excitement behind Bcache FS. There actually is because uh, compared for its age, I would believe that it's actually as stable as some people claim that it is. Because uh, and it should be better than its contemporary. Equivalent, yeah. which is ZFS and BTRFS. Yeah, because, because uh, Bcache... You could learn from those two. Okay, so Kent Overstreet did this talk years ago. And uh, I believe I found it off of like a, a YouTube channel that just like posts talks. I can't think of it off the top of my head. But he was talking about Bcache FS, and he said that ZFS was the first copyright and write system that did things right. But... There, there were some, there were some media improvements that many people saw, and they created ButterFS. ButterFS uh, relies off of B trees, which is a whole different concept than what ZFS uses. I don't know what the ZFS file system yeah. concept is, and B tree, uh, B tree. Let's not go in too much into that because I know enough about those, and yeah, it's not an easy topic to explain. Yeah, it, but. Uh, the fact that ButterFS relies on B trees to handle the uh, the B tree model to handle uh, the data has been the, the the whole crux of the issues from like RAID five and six, which is generally yes. what uh, people would use on like NAS devices. Nobody nobody uses RAID five and six in the data center. If you are, you're you're doing it wrong. You should be using RAID ten, but uh, RAID ten and then put a separate uh, put depends. a uh, FS file system on top of it. It depends. You should uh, first of all, you should remember that most people in the data center would be using some kind of, not a NAS, but a SAN device. Yeah. And yeah, those tend to not do rate 10. They, they use some sort of 
either erasure coding or something similar. But we should also remember that the standard for ZFS is is Z rate two or Z rate one, which is equivalent of uh, five and six, rate five, rate six. Yeah. Now uh, he says in print in uh, parentheses here, peanut gallery. Which, uh, that's what you and I are, Big Pod. Uh, please don't rush on yes. to switch to BcacheFS just yet. I still have a backlog log of bugs and issues. Because it's software, it's going to have bugs. Uh, but, anyways, he's been doing this a long time. I've had people running my code in production for a very long time. And I've been working with my users on a daily basis to address issues. Uh, uh, is there anything, like, actually good here? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, th 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 there was more discussion yeah. between Linus and Kent afterwards, and uh, Linus uh, Linus hit that that it's universally uh, more trustworthy than ButterFS or B3FS or yeah. BTRFS, well, however you want to call it. Linus, Linus countered on this point. I believe the stability yeah. arguments when major distros start using it. <laughs> yeah, like he literally said. I believe he literally said that. Yep. That they are major distros in Fedora, anyone? <laughs> OpenSUSE, anyone? I use ButterFS. You use ButterFS. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, the conversation just uh, begins to slowly get to the point where it begins spiraling. Uh, Lighted, this is yeah. still a very active uh, discussion by the time we're looking at this. Because, you know, this was... Well, we had a weekend between uh between this here, so you know maybe they just decided to take a weekend off. But uh, big pod, is it a good idea to uh say take your project, make a whole bunch of changes, and then your project is part of something bigger, so you want to take all of the changes that you made and just shove them all at once at the bigger project? No. Again, I, as someone who worked in uh, software industry for a few years, <laughs> I can say that you shouldn't just throw fire hose things, especially taking taking rules and not caring about them, and fire hosing features, fire hosing things into. Some someone else's code because what you're doing, you're fire hosing your your things into someone else's code. You are playing on someone else's playground. You should you should follow someone else's playbook, not yours, but someone else's. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's fine to update your code and push the updates forward, but you have to remember that your code is now set part of something bigger. So, yes. and because you're part of something bigger, you have to follow things a little bit more strictly. The Linux kernel development model has been set in place for almost 30 years at this point. Yeah. They're not going to change it just because you're a special snowflake. So, uh, of course, Linus is going to say, stop this. Because that's what Linus does. That's what he's famous for doing, is telling people to just stop. Sometimes not nearly as nice. Sometimes, actually, pretty often not nicely. But, uh, you, so, Kent, I, I imagine that, uh, you might be a listener. Uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll get talking about this here in a minute. But, uh, Kent, I appreciate you for all the work that you do. I really do. If I ever met you in person, I would buy you a beer and a burger. I promise you that. Uh, speaking You're of which, doing something impressive, whether it's, whether yeah. it is something at the end or not, it's still a file system after all. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a file system, <laughs> and it it actually does work. <laughs> so yes, uh, and, it, and it isn't one file system for one disk doing something that you you would basically a single disk. It's it's for a whole set of disks. Yeah, and uh, I'll be honest with you. If BcacheFS continues to, continues to stick around and it continues to uh, can improve and prove that it's actually as reliable as yep. you claim it is, I might even give it a look. 
Uh, Same. Because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm excited to always see a, br- a brand new project that could be technically better than what I have now. Light of yeah. what I have now is working perfectly fine for me. I don't really have much reason to switch to anything else, mostly because I know ButterFS. But uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, so I'm not going to, like, jump and run for BcashFS. But if you if you keep up going as you go and you know one of these days i might have like a disk failure that borks my entire file system setup which i don't think that's actually going to happen but uh, you never know you never know uh i might just give i might just uh convert everything to bcache fs by then but uh keep doing the good work in the meantime maybe you shouldn't be pushing new features past the feature window yeah and that's something honestly i learned in ubuntu land when freezes happen there is no changes end of story uh, freezes happen uh don't be pu- don't be pushing this new updated version of mate even though i know you secretly want to because it just released yes. like a week after because that always happens yep <laughs> Uh, Ain't gonna no, happen. <laughs> yep, yep. Don't do it. Nope. Uh, the only thing, the only patches we are taking are security and stability. Even if the version yeah. number bump is a stability change. <laughs> but that's uh, how it is. Yep. So, Big Pod, we have been getting noticed by some people. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a few notable names that uh, might be recognizable for other. Their audience members might not be that uh, you know have given our, our podcast a listen and some feedback, but I but uh, you know since uh, it's an active discussion between me and Big Pod right now, I want to do just a general state of the show because uh, we this is episode twenty two and we have been going pretty reliably for four months now. Yeah, pretty which, reliably. You know, yeah, pretty reliably. Like I actually don't think I, that we've. I I missed- hope. I hope B B Cash FS has better reliability than us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At uh, this point. Yeah. Uh, Lighted, I don't think we've missed a week, but we have missed a day. <laughs> we have missed a week. Oh, once. we have okay, we have missed one week. Yes. You yes. know what? That's more reliable than than some YouTube channels that I know. <laughs> yeah. So we're doing pretty good. But anyways, uh so at this point in time, we have can I get like a total number off of this thing here? No, I don't think so. Oh, but okay. while you you talk, I can I can I can pull this thing called calculator and do a bit of a calculation. Okay, okay, big pod while you're doing math. Uh, I'm gonna talk about like these some of these numbers here, and I'm gonna have a link available in the description down below of where you can view all of our analytics live for the audio feed. Uh, that and uh, this is through a service called OP3, uh, and according to OP3, over the last seven days, we have received 23 downloads, which I know is doesn't sound amazing, but that's you got to remember this is a third-party service that's pulling just from our Castapod instance directly. That's not counting iTunes, not counting Amazon, not counting Spotify, and uh, not counting half the other podcast services I may not remember signing up for but i think i, I posted to them anyway well podcast index and um, i believe amazon well and... podcast index is really just an aggreg- aggregator they don't actually yeah. distribute anything i believe they do have a web thing you can use but i looked at it once so i don't know yeah but the number i calculated from our castopod instance on how many downloads we have together is 1126 i will give plus or minus 20 on that okay well uh i i know that i know our bandwidth numbers at least so uh when it comes when it comes to bandwidth this is this is that thing that we talk about at every single episode where where the podcast is cheap but it's not free and it's potentially going to get very expensive as we grow uh, for the last episode published, this is episode 20, Monopolizing Google, uh, that pushed out 1,634 
megabytes. Yeah. Not bits, bytes. Now, uh, that is one. That is about one point five gigabytes of data. Yeah. And our handy little uh, ser- ser- single server uh, running in Atlanta, Georgia, pu- pushed that out pretty reliably to everybody, as far as we know. Uh, th- we had some issues with the YouTube channel. Uh, uh, that's that's an encoding issue from YouTube. Uh, that happens sometimes. No, it's actually a coding issue on my side. Okay, that's Big Pod screwing up. Yes. But, hey, uh, these things happen. But uh, oh- To alleviate the issue, I have added another step to the quality check which is opening the file instead of just checking if it's there <laughs> and scrubbing through the whole thing and, and you see if the player ever crashes okay i could probably automate that if i wanted yeah well uh for apps uh the number one app that's used to download to download and listen to our podcast is actually antennapod from a- which is an open source android uh application at 71.2% for the month of July. Yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, the second one being Apple Podcast, because uh, when it comes to uh, podcast, when it comes to the world of podcasts, uh, most of our traffic comes through iTunes. Uh, so uh, we, we have a 16.67% download rate from Apple Podcast for the month of July. But if you look at the overall numbers, uh, Apple Podcast is probably number one, uh, other yeah. than Pocket Cast, which Pocket Cast is an in- was is an iOS app. So, iTunes is a pretty big deal in the world of podcasting. So, if you yeah. have an iTunes account, leave us a review, give us a good gu- give us a good score, or you know, just be brutally honest. And and if you're on a Spotify, give us a comment and uh, uh what the, and a uh, rating, which we believe we, we are currently at the pure five. We to believe five reviews. Well, that's good. People, people are actually looking at it. I, I'll be honest. I don't look at the Spotify or iTunes pages often myself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's five reviews with all five stars. Well, that's good. That's We're good. Doing Pe- good. Uh, people like you specifically, Big Pod. I'm just here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure it's the other way around. All right, all right. Uh, when it comes to web browsers, uh, browsing our website, uh, the most popular browser that's used is Firefox. After that is Tuckspace.com, so the website checking itself, and uh, Chrome, then Edge, then Safari, then Opera, then Podbean, which is another podcast aggregator. And then the country that loves us the most, Big Pod. Can you guess which one that is? I don't think I need to guess. It's the United States of America. Of course, because uh, God bless the USA. Yeah, it makes sense. But I know there are some interesting countries um, in that list, including my beloved, Slovenia. Yeah, Slovenia at number three. Yeah. (laughs) The little country that could. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, right behind Slovenia. Oh, yeah. And uh, the country, because, you know, it's uh, dealing with uh, Big Bad Germany right at number four. Uh, number two, by the way, is Spain, because uh, Spanish people. Yeah. Uh, then we got Puerto Rico, which is basically United States, but not quite United States. Yeah. That's that's a topic. Uh, then we we got somebody listening to us from Bangladesh. I actually don't... I actually don't necessarily remember my geography that well, and I had to look up to see exactly where Bangladesh was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I I'm apologize. I'm blanking, but isn't that in Asia? Uh, it is right. Yeah, it's in Asia. Okay. It's it's a uh, right on. It's a uh, right east of India. I remember some. At least I remember something about geography from primary school. Yep. Yep. On the right side, I still know where Slovenia is on the map. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we got Belgium and French and eleven point one percent other. Other. That's a, that's a very interesting country. I always wanted to visit. Yeah, I would I would love to visit other. I wonder what other consists of. It doesn't actually tell us, but uh, no, I bet you that if we uh, really tried, we, I have a we question for you. Out. I just I just thought of what's the, since every country has their own country code for for the 
uh, website for the domain TLD. What's the what's the TLD of the country of other? Well, I think that OT is taken. Yeah. Mm. Well, maybe it's a collection of them. Yeah, probably. Or you know, it could just be like super generic, like dot com. Yeah. Well, who knows? After after that comedic over uh, uh, interlude, let's continue with the more serious part of the state of the no tax allowed podcast. Yeah. Uh, overall, uh, our listenership has leveled out. Uh, yeah. We're we're averaging uh, between between all the platforms, we're averaging about thirty downloads uh, per episode, which I know. We're small. 30 to uh, that, 60, that, that, I would that's... say. If you look at the numbers, like an aggregate per episode would be across all together, probably around 60, I guess. Yeah. So uh, that that's basically where we're at. Of course, our most popular episode is the pilot of all pilots, our yes. very first episode, because, you know, people, were just, people always get excited to see a, a brand new podcast. So yeah. uh, if you've been listening to us since episode one, send us an email. Yeah. <laughs> And and let us know that hey, uh, have we improved since the first recording? Have we gotten worse? And what has Josh? What should has, be improved? Uh, has Josh gotten less hair? Is he actually going more bald? Say, same with me. It's the same <laughs> question for me. And those of you who watch the video side, no, uh, will notice that I'm like the, the the that bit of hair that I have on on top of my head. That is part of the forehead. I'm correcting how it's how it sits on my head. <laughs> that little bit that's still on my forehead. I gave up. It kind of just stays in place. Well, but yeah, anyways, I need a haircut. Uh, so I think that uh, I'm glad that we have consistent numbers. Yeah. Uh, uh, between uh, thir- thirty downloads across the board, uh, the average listenership roughly reflects the downloads. Uh, it's it's actually double the amount of listens compared to the downloads. Uh, yeah. If we look at the YouTube channel itself, the YouTube channel gets roughly the same amount of traffic as well. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we got some we got some feedback from like another uh, somewhat popular podcast that said that we should probably invest in the in the uh, YouTube a little bit more. Which yeah. I don't know how I don't know how much we should delve into YouTube. Because at some point, if we're going to be like going deep into like YouTube content, we, I want to you know have like a alternative op- alternative option to YouTube as well. Simply because you know, the last episode, episode we released being monopolizing Google, we, uh, YouTube has a future, but we don't know how long it is. Yeah, but- we don't know how relevant it is. Maybe we should look at something else as well. I'm gonna say, until that happens, we're gonna be just fine with YouTube. Honestly, uh, pro probably. Well, YouTube's at least gonna be around for the next four years. Yeah, uh, I can guarantee that. We can guess about that at least. So I think, I think we should be fine for most part. Uh, should be, but yeah. hopefully before before then, you know, uh, we we have the fun the funding available. Uh, so, to spin up our own wonderful video streaming service. Yes. So, if you are uh, some sort of uh, cloud provider, I don't know. Uh, th- th- there are b- three of three of them are pretty big, and some of them are small. Uh, give us uh, an email. Is this the one mentioned in every episode? Contact at taxbase dot com, where we could talk about a sponsorship. I would I would like that. Maybe have maybe have a bit, a bit of redundancy in my server setup. That would that would be great. Wait, wait. Are you saying that you don't like connecting to a server that's in Atlanta, Georgia? No, I I don't like that. I'm connect that I need to connect need to connect to a Silga server, and if that server goes down, my podcast disappeared from the world. That's true. That's true. Uh, that has happened once. Yes. <laughs> that's my problem. We need. At least two servers in separate locations, or possibly multiple locations. Or, or, if you're not a cloud provider, 
but you think you can help us with that. And you can help us either directly or financially. Send us an email, first of all. But if you're willing to help us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash no tucks allowed. Yes. yes, we have one of those things. Uh, if you sign up for us on Patreon and give us at least a dollar, I, at least I think it's a dollar. I think it's You five. get a higher... It, okay, I don't know my pa- my own Patreon too because <laughs> I don't... I, I don't check this uh, very often enough. All I know is that last I, last I checked, uh, we didn't have any patrons yet. But hey, if you're a patron, uh, you get a higher quality audio feed because that's about all we can think of to put on there right now. Yeah. And <laughs> but, you know, if you we, wish to we could... help us even more, there are also 10 and $20 tiers with basically fund, fund our travel funds. Yeah, funding our travel funds because you know I would love to to go on my Euro trip just so I can visit Big Pod. Yeah, and, but of course, if I'm going to go on my Euro trip, an episode together in the same room on a couch, we, maybe we could. We could. <laughs> I bed. could figure out. I could find out just how bad his Wi-Fi is. Yes, it's bad. <laughs> and then Big Pod can come over here and visit the cornfields of Ohio. <laughs> I have a feeling I'm gonna feel more at home than you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know i i think it would be awesome if i could uh you know take a trip to, trip out to europe because uh, i'll be honest with you as an american i don't really have many reasons to actually leave my country because you know my country's so big i can just see everything at home but i can't find a big pot at home and there's also all these wonderful events that i that i want to go to and then i find out that they're in europe like you know i want to go to Fostum. Fostum looks like a cool place to be <laughs> uh and then you know uh i think guadec the next guadec is going to be in europe uh which is you know that's the gnome developer conference if you did if you didn't know i think kde has their own conference that's that's also typically found in europe well and although i think europe is the middle of the world <laughs> that that's true that's true and you know i i I kind of want to see all these things that I read about in books, you know, uh, you know, like typical tourist stuff. Like, you know, if I go to Italy, I want to go to Rome. I want to see all that wonderful architecture that was built a thousand years ago. Uh, if I, I want to go to like uh, uh, Venice because, you know, I want to I want to pilot a boat going down it down through a street. You know, I've, I want to make a month trip out of this, you know. Yeah. That just sounds like a whole lot of fun. Yeah. And, you know, uh. Big Pot can come and join me because you know he his country is an EU member, so yes. he can just apparently just go across borders, I, unlike me. <laughs> I, I I could just go. Yeah, he could just go. I need a I need to get a passport first. <laughs> but then when but it come, hey, come you in, you can just go as well. Anywhere you want. Yeah. In EU. Yeah. Or within That's Schengen a, if, region. If you, Let's be specific. Yeah. But correct. Yeah, and then you know I might be able to learn some Slovenian at some point. <laughs> yes, you may. But hey, you know what? Uh, you, uh, you can also recognize that this podcast also is not free for us to operate. Yeah. Uh, it, it is cheap. I can float it because you know I've been floating it this entire time, and you know I have just wrote, I just wrote wrote that funding off. But I would like to get some supplemental help with it as we continue as we continue to grow because eventually. We're going to be paying for that for that S three storage bucket that that are, we're distributing all our episodes through because there there is a limit to that free tier. Yeah, we're we're not close to it. It'll take us a while to get there. But at one point, but there we is a limit. It. Yeah. So eventually, as we continue to produce episodes, we will hit it. And you know, I I would like to be able to spin up like redundant remote servers as well. But of course. Even though it's like a five dollar box here, five dollar box there, a five dollar box there, we're distributing across an entire an, an entire planet, and I recognize that my little server in Atlanta, Georgia, doesn't da- doesn't uh, distribute the podcast super 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 quick yeah. to the person that's that's trying to wa- listen to it from Bangladesh. Thankfully, our I want to make at, le- at least our S three bucket is hosted by s- people who have servers worldwide and dot. Da- do allow to have some sort of CDN around the world. So at least episodes download quickly if you don't get yeah. the text files all that quick. But, you know, when I talk about the show notes, the yeah. show notes aren't, distribu- aren't distributed with the MP3 file. 
they come from our server. Or maybe just and just getting the whole uh, feed can take up uh, actually quite a bit longer for somebody who lives not on the same content as our server. Yeah. So, like, that guy in Bangladesh, he's as far as it can get. That's literally the other side of the world yeah. from me. So, I want to make your experience better. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Which I understand that, uh, you know, not a lot of podcasters want to make, like, a single person's experience better in, in Bangladesh. Like, I know that the I know that uh, they talked on, like, the WAN show from, like, from Linus Tech Tips about how they literally fixed their uh, video streaming site so that way somebody could watch it from South from from the south pole but hey you know what we're, we're not as big as them but hey it's pretty cool that they're willing to go that far and too. if somebody wants to wa- wants to listen to us from o- o- way o- way over up there i would love to see that on, on the charts <laughs> i'd love to that, see it too That'd for be me that would be an actual achievement yep so anyways uh we uh, we are available on the YouTube if you want to watch us live there. Not really but live, but get... at least you see us. Yeah, our vi- our video feeds are there. You you get to look at us, and I know that the, uh, and I know that uh, people some people tell us that we need to invest more into the YouTube channel, but realistically, the only reason we're posting on YouTube is because YouTube is an amazing platform for discoverability, yeah. and uh, that that's that's why we're posting there. And but if you want to get our episodes sooner, because you need to hear us more, our audio feed is edited faster than the video feed is. And more importantly, so, it's uploaded more consistently. <laughs> yeah, it, it it uploads more consistently as well. Yeah. So if you want to get us as quick as possible, go to, go to show.tuckspace.com slash nta. And uh, that that will take you straight to our front page for the for the podcast. And from there, you can listen to listen to or download each episode. You don't even have to subscribe to download an episode, Big Pod. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, you you just don't have to. So just and you know, uh, the licensing for our show. I know that there's that there's not really one posted, but uh, you know, if you want to like take a clip and remix it. Go right ahead. I'm giving you permission. I I own this show, so go right ahead. <laughs> within reason, but, hey, of course. Yeah, w- within reason. You know, uh, fair use you still can only applies, make big... and all that. Yeah, fa- fair use. All that legal mumbo jumbo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but hey, uh, if you want to like give us feedback, oh, I said that you can send us an email. That you just send us an email to contact at tuckspace.com. We actually got an angry email yes. and that told us that we had an issue with the YouTube video, Thank which you. uh, we got fixed. Thank you. Yep. Th- thanks for sending us the angry email. Send us more. I appreciate yeah. it. And he even put in the subject line this is an <laughs> angry email. It was great. <laughs> I mean, he was having a legitimate issue. So, you yeah. know what? It was rightfully angry. And, and I appreciate that. Uh, of course, if you want to get to us directly, you can go to these links here. Uh, these are federated. These are Fediverse accounts that you can talk to us. That's that Mastodon thing that you might have heard about. You can talk to us through Mastodon. I believe it even works with Twitter threads, or not Twitter threads, Instagram threads, the or Snapchat. Meta threads. Threads. I I'll just call it yes. threads. That's what most people yeah. call it. Th- that thing, at least at least in some parts of the world, is federated. So. Maybe finger. Yeah, it's federated if crossed. you turned it on. Federated. Yeah, it's federated if you turn it on. Yeah, of course you need to turn it on. Of course, yes. But, yeah, but it, you know, actually open in all countries, I believe. I don't think so. It's open enough. Yeah. I know that I I I know that I can I can look at the stuff uh, that uh, are posted on threads, cool. and and I'm glad that uh, my Mastodon service, which is Fastodon. Uh, is not is not going to be one of those that just automatically block threads like some of them have. Uh, I know I know a service that definitely won't be, won't be blocking threads. Oh, is that your mastodon yes. that you finally got fixed? No, I still haven't. <laughs> oh my god! And the reason for it <laughs> is pure laziness. It of course it has. I just have to run a one command. I just haven't yet because I'm lazy. 
a uh, podman up no it's kubectl oh, okay. apply dash f and a set of files oh okay okay well anyways guys that's going to be it for the show we'll catch you next week uh maybe maybe i might actually have some big announcements by then goodbye <laughs>